All right. Wow, this microphone is extremely on. Okay. Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for sticking around uh, through lunch and surviving all the heat. Um, I'm Tori. I'm the product manager for VPS at Niantic. I've uh, been with the company for about 15 months. Uh, for that long experience working on localization and mapping tech. Uh, and I'm really excited to be joined by three of our engineering leaders uh, that make Lightship VPS possible. Um, so I'd like to invite uh, Victor, Pierre, and Grima to come join us on the stage. So in terms of what we've got planned uh, for this session, we've got 40 minutes. There were some really excellent questions. Uh, thanks to everyone who joined us uh, just right before this for the building with VPS conversation. Uh, there were a lot of uh, like funny uh, questions where I was like, oh, you should talk to the next panel. This is that panel. Um, so like, give us all your crazy questions about like roadmap or pricing or like, how is this different from other stuff that's out there? How should I use it? How does it break? What does the future look like? Um, that's, these are the right people to ask those questions too, and we're so stoked to have you here to talk about that. Uh, but before we dive in, uh, I want to give uh, my other panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves. Um, so, Victor, would you like to go next? Yeah, let's start. So, I'm, I'm Victor. I'm chief scientist of Niantic. Sort of, that's my, my, my night job. Uh, during the day, I'm an associate professor with the Department of Engineering Science, University of Oxford. And I was also a co founder, the, the technical co founder at 6Z.ai. So, ask me any questions about the, the thing sort of compares. Uh, hey, my name is Pierre Fitzgerald. I'm an uh, engineering manager at Niantic. I've been actually finally uh, joined uh, Niantic the same day as Tori did uh, 15 months ago. Uh, I, like Victor, come from an academic background, uh, studied computer vision, studied in AR in 2005, been in the space for a while, been trying to build VPS for quite some time. Uh, most recently, I was at Google working on a uh, project like Cardboard, project like AR Core, uh, and recently location for Android. So. If you have a question about that, but now building VPS. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Garima. I'm an engineering manager on the augmented reality team. Uh, I work more on the infrastructure side of things. Uh, have been at Niantic for three plus years. Before this, I have almost 12 plus years of experience building platforms and infrastructure. All right. Uh, thanks, everyone. And then just one other just technical note. Uh, Folks are welcome to come up to the microphone uh, during the session and ask questions live. Uh, if you'd rather ask your question anonymously, uh, or if you just want it to show up on my laptop here, I'm not just browsing Reddit. I actually have a list of questions. Uh, if you go to slido.com, enter in that reference number, you can actually see questions that other folks have seeded or ask your own questions, upload other questions, and that's another way to sort of facilitate the conversation. We just want to keep this open, fun, casual. Uh, but I have a couple like big questions that I've heard asked like throughout today and even the past couple weeks and past couple months during our private beta. Um, so one of the things I actually mentioned this morning in the keynote, I talked about the concept of persistence. So like one question uh, for our panel is what is persistence and why does VPS matter for persistence? Me. Persistence. Why? Persistence is our ability to find the same location in, in real space between different users or between different times of day and night, uh, less night, but you know, day, night, different seasons. So we want the ability to say that here is a place in the world, here is a location on, related to that place in the world, and we want to be able to find the same location um, throughout the next year in a different season at night. And yeah, I guess uh, the other thing to, to add to it is we, we center uh, persistence on waste spots, so location that we know, so you don't have to map them, which I think is a key uh, advantage of our technology. All right, thank you. Next question I've got here is, uh, how does map building work, or how does the map building pipeline work? Um, yeah, thanks for the question, Tori. So, uh, so basically, the whole process starts with us getting scans, and these scans could come either from our players, which is either Pokemon Go, Ingress, uh, our games, or they can come from our surveyors, uh, which we, we, uh, they go out to like specific locations to collect scans. Uh, once we have these scans uploaded, uh, they go through scan processing, where we scrub out uh, private data, such as faces, license plates, and stuff. Uh, and the other thing that happens here is we determine the quality of 
these scans using FQC, uh, scan quality classifier. Uh, once this happens, the next process is uh, building maps from these scans using, like, so this process gets triggered by waste spots. We figure out which waste spots do we want to activate, and we, we start the map building process, uh, which starts by figuring out all the scans that are associated with a particular waste spot, uh, then sending them through a single map building pipeline, which uh, builds maps for these scans, and then aligning them, which basically uh, creates edges between these maps and creates a single space so that you, when you are localizing, you can use different maps but still remain in the same coordinate system. Thanks, Karima. The next question we have here is, how do scans become maps? Uh, I guess sort of to build on that a little bit, facilitate, uh, what are the different things that we build from scans and what are the purposes of those different things? So, uh, I'll take that and, and that's also related to a question that somebody asked before. The Niantic VPS is sort of layered. There are layers that are useful for localization, and that's the, the VPS stuff that you're, you're seeing today. We have different types of those uh, working in different ways. But there are also layers that would be more human readable. We have meshing layers, we have semantic meshing layers. The same sort of thing that somebody asked, if we know whether something, what, is the, what, what the vertex is in a mesh, that we're building those today. In fact, we are linking uh, everything that you saw in terms of depth estimation uh, and, and meshing from uh, the other sort of part of light shift, those do get built for the scans that the user have uh, or, or upload to us on the VPS side. This data will be available at some point, um, and, and we hope that the developers will use it. But we do have more than just the positioning system we're building at right now. Uh, there's actually one question I'd love to hear just maybe one thought from each of you on. Uh, could you talk a little bit about some of the biggest challenges of building VPS? You want to start, yeah. Pierre? Sure. Um, I guess, uh, the, I think the key difference is that uh, from people that know uh, the current mapping technology uh, that are used by different companies is the standard method today is, is to either use satellites uh, and aerial images or, or to drive a set of cars with camera mounted on them. What we have done is to crowdsource the process by gathering images uh, from users. And so that data is a lot more noisy. And the, the biggest challenge for us is to, was to create something that could scale to millions of scans very quickly, uh, but also could reject and confirm that some data was valid. Uh, so that was the, like working with UGC uh, data, user genetic content was, uh, was a key challenge for us to, to serve us. And then the other uh, goal that we had in mind was to, to create a, a service that could basically give you an answer within a second. Uh, and so a lot of iteration went into creating plot service that would be respondent enough uh, to have an answer like this. Good afternoon. I'm Larry Walker, CTO of a company called Mimic, where we help creators create cool experiences with augmented reality in, in the real world. So we've been studying BPS and very excited about the path you guys are putting forward. You announced earlier the, the cities that you're coming forward with very soon. Uh, I'm from Atlanta, which is, uh, we're not as big as you guys in San Francisco on the tech side, but on the entertainment side, it's a pretty good hub for that. We're interested in creating a lot of cool experiences there. So I'm curious, um, I don't know how far Atlanta is in your pipeline in terms of coming forward with BPS, but is there anything that we could do to kind of help with that? Like we have people on campuses that can record videos, create different experiences. I'm curious, how can we make that something that's available to use more frequently, more sooner than later? That is a very good question. Uh, so in terms of, the considerations that we think about when we approach new locations. Uh, VPS really is infrastructure. It takes a lot of work to bring a new location online. Uh, so we think about things like we're really interested in impact. Uh, and we measure impact in a lot of different ways. So one of the things we think about is like, well, how many people could use this experience? How many developers are in this area? Uh, and then also there's a lot of sort of emergent opportunities and trends that could, like certain cities make a lot more sense uh, for those sorts of things. Uh, the good news is Atlanta will be live this year. Uh, <laughs> but another really important thing and another reason why we're so excited to be having so many conversations with all of you here today is we, we're listening to you and we really care about like, the cities that really matter for you. Uh, and this, the first big cities, the first six that we're really targeting that we mentioned this morning, like that's, we already have a lot more than that. There's probably closer to a dozen or even 20 that have substantial numbers of activated locations. But in the near term, a lot of this is going to be a reflection of where there's already the most AR activity, especially within sort of the Niantic AR mapping ecosystem. 
uh, but there are some really concrete ways that developers can be part of that solution. Uh, so for example, the Niantic Wayfair app uh, that we talked about allows anyone to go out and scan, add new scans at Wayspots. We will soon be able to tell you like which ones have how many scans. Uh, there's actually a feature in Ingress today that will show you that, which is super cool. Um, but also like anyone that's here, like we're listening to you, talk to our DevRel team, let us know like what your ambitions are, like what your plans are for these cities, and that is a very real consideration uh, in terms of how we scale from here. Quick follow up, for the city that you are announcing, in terms of coverage, like is it almost everything is there, 50%, like how do you think about density for the cities that are, li that are live? That's a really good question as well. So I referenced, uh, I referenced this morning, there's sort of three different sources of data. By far the largest is our player base today. So any, if you've ever interacted with the scanning a Pokestop or scanning a portal in Ingress, that's a humongous amount of the data that we have comes from that. The other two sources of that uh, are our surveyors, so we can actually do targeted data collection, uh, but we're, we're definitely not covering the entire planet in targeted data collection. This is more of like a, an opportunity to seed new locations. Uh, and then the third one that we open up today is actually working with our developers to speed that up as well. Um, and we'll probably be talking some more very soon about how to speed that up even further and then sort of invite our, the users of our developers on board to be part of that ecosystem addition. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ali Hantal. I'm with a company XR Masters. We develop spatial content management platform and we've been working with different VPSs but they all kind of, kind of purchased and we were like having difficulty finding a VPS. I'm so, so excited that finally we are going to be using Niantic VPS. We have been working a lot in Europe and especially in the uh, city of Istanbul and Ankara. And uh, um, actually May Ankara's mayor is very interested in uh, doing AR cloud work for the smart cities. So I was wondering if you, do you have a ro one roadmap question is like, uh, how can we, we also, we already started scanning those cities. So uh, we have a team that can do that. Uh, do you have in plans bringing in any cities in Istanbul or Ankara or, or in uh, other places like not big cities like in Europe that you listed? How can we be a part of that? Yeah, I think the, the general answer I would give to that, again, is like, talk to us, um, and you've got my attention. I'm very excited about bringing more and more cities online, and Ankara and Istanbul are not small cities. Like, that's, those are huge places where we could have a ton of impact. And again, like, a, one really important thing that we need to do is also furnish you with the tools that are necessary. Um, there's a lot of technical details that these folks know a lot about in terms of what types of scanning data we're able to use. We're always interested in being able to incorporate more and more types of data, but the way that our system works today, we're really optimizing for being able to work with as many different devices as possible. Um, but there's definitely some sort of like apples and oranges, bananas type types of data where like they're all useful. Uh, but in terms of the way our pipeline is set up to run today, um, we're, let me turn that around a little bit. So. If the, all the data has been collected, there are probably some ways that we could use it, but our pipeline today is very specific in terms of how it's utilized, again, to be able to address billions of different devices. Um, but I, I think the short answer would be like, yes, those are definitely cities that are interesting to us and uh, would love to follow up with you uh, either later today, tomorrow, or uh, with our DevRel team to I'll talk definitely. about the opportunity. Yeah, I'll definitely find you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just one thing to add to this is uh, though there are not public way spots available, you still have the private scan pipeline. So uh, you can map your office and start development. So through the Niantic Wayfair app, uh, we provide the ability that you can have just private scans, which would be, yeah, which would be just visible to you and you can localize you. But that's not gonna be coverage in No. Yeah, that's correct. But if you, know, if you wanted to, to mock a location to try to see like A, there is a, uh, that mosque or that uh, church that you wanted to map or try something out to, to show that landmark, like you could basically mock it with a private scan to kind of demonstrate what you would be capable of doing. Hello, uh, Stephen with Coral Labs. Uh, I just had a question for you guys. We're currently using Azure Spatial Linkers. What would be the key feature that would sell us, to, or even technically from using this to using the VPS that you guys have now? There's a differentiating thing. Like, what would be the, the key so you, feature to... So you, you're saying uh, you're using Azer, uh, yeah, Azure? Uh, Azure. So do um, similar relocalization and things. What so would be the key differentiating like factor? You don't have to map anything. You just show up and it works. Like, we tell you where you can go and play, and you can go and play, and so, you know, that's the key, I think, difference is. Okay. 
Victor, agreement, anything else you'd, you'd add on that? Um, I, th I think one of our advantages is we have our players, uh, Pokemon Go and Grace, and we have scans from them. So uh, we have the capacity to build maps at a lot of more locations as well. That is also likely to lead to better accuracy. Because at, at each one of our POIs, we might have data, or waste posts, we might have data captured at different times of, different seasons, different times of the year, day, night, literally. Well, one of them has, for example, 80 scans, and you can see the changing in the leaves through the seasons. Because of that, we can build a system that is more robust to those changes. So to, to answer one of the questions that was asked before, it should definitely work uh, at different lights, but I'd expect it to work with snow, um, you know, in, assuming, of course, at some point it snowed there, I would assume the system to work just fine in between snow and, and, and drought. And, and I guess... <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> you go. Go ahead. Uh, hi, I'm curious uh, how uh, accurate your global positioning is. Are you just doing it off of GPS, or did you do something fancier? So the, the localization system is accurate. The, the median error is about this much in translation, uh, and it's about 1.15 degrees in, in rotation. So it's quite accurate relative to our, to our maps. The part that is not there yet is the, the geopositioning of the maps. That will be there soon. Yeah, to put a slightly finer point on uh, that very good question. So every time you enter a VPS activated location, so at, at a waste spot and you localize, what you're actually getting back from the server with your localization is your six degree of freedom pose relative to that location. So what we're sending back is a, a four by four matrix, so X, Y, Z, and a quatern quaternion <laughs> that tells you exactly where you are relative to that location. We are not returning a super fine latitude, longitude, altitude, or elevation. Um, that process called georeferencing, or, or making the map relative to an ECF, or a central Earth fixed coordinate frame, that's really hard, uh, and we're working on that. Uh, but I'm gonna stick with Victor's answer of soon. Um, the good news is, uh, you probably noticed there's a ton of incredible experiences today. Even, you can even like render objects that are hundreds of meters away and they show up right where they're supposed to and you actually don't need uh, georeferencing to make that work. Uh, where georeferencing becomes a lot more important is when you have gigantic contiguous areas the size of a whole city blocks where you still need to understand the relationship between yourself and areas that are also far away. Um, it's a very worthwhile goal but it is actually one of the grand challenges of AR mapping and uh, we are working on it. Um, we've got another big upvoted question here about, uh, can you explain the difference between a private scan versus and a private location as compared to a scan at a Niantic waste spot? Um, you want to? Go ahead. All right, um, so usually, like, the way you need to think about a private waste spot is it is not a location that, you know, is publicly uh, accessible by everyone. So it could be your office, uh, it could be uh, a desk area, um, and, Usually you would scan only one, you would only provide one scan, so the robustness of a private scan will be less than, than what we have when we build, uh, when we enable a waste spot uh, with UGC where we have, uh, we may have like hundreds of, of scans for given locations. Yes, Larry? Okay. Uh, yes, uh, VPS, if it's at a waste spot is at a location where a lot of people are, congregating around, is that going to impact the accuracy of how things might get placed? Not really. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it, should, it is quite robust to, to people walking in places. It should not really change. That being said, if somebody dresses up like a tree, uh, <laughs> so it, it, it should be quite robust to changes. Yes. Okay, great. And one other quick question. Um, I think I heard earlier today that Eighth Wall, the web AR, platform will also support VPS, or, or does maybe. Um, are there any differences between how 8th Wall will support it as compared to Lightship? I can try. Yeah, to, go ahead. So, I mean, the 8th yeah. Wall team will be better than me to, to give that in, uh, in pure detail. So, 
basically, we, we've demonstrated that we can run it on, on the web. I think the, the differences will most likely be uh, how you store your, your Westport anchor, because there is no local storage within, uh, within the web. Or, so I think that API might be slightly different in order for, so managing your Westport anchors will be different as a developer, uh, but otherwise uh, the, the capability are, will be the same. Thank you. All right, we have a new number one question, which is, can VPS be used to create shared AR experiences? Is that a product question? Or? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yes, it can. Uh, the current API currently don't. Uh, you can try to make the API work together, uh, but it's not a completely supported workflow right now. But we're working on, on improving that very soon. Hello, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, one question I had is what factors play into um, adding to the accuracy of the meshes? Say, for instance, you have 80, 80 scans of a location. Uh, what points in those scans are you using to make that mesh more accurate? So that, that's one of the things that we've actually look, looked at. And, and interestingly enough, um, th there is no, so for, for meshing, there are sort of things like you want to be a bit closer. Uh, when you mapped. Um, ideally, you want a phone that is able to generate a consistent trajectory over time. So you don't want to, to, to have a phone that's very busy that uh, ends up getting, giving you an inaccurate pose as you're sort of moving around and scanning the location. So um, for building accurate meshes, you want to be closer and you want to be stable. For positioning, it's sort of the opposite. You'd want to be as random as possible when you, when you map the place because you want to be sort of from positions that users could be seeing that same location. So for, for, for that, it's slightly different. And, and interestingly enough, the, the only uh, differentiator we've found so far in terms of positioning accuracy between sequences is the type of mobile phone, nothing else so far. Follow-up question um, of an idea that came to my mind when you were answering that. Um, so say, for instance, you're, you're scanning an area that's uh, very heavily, it's got a lot of foot traffic, and say someone comes, comes in through your scan and it, it adds um, extra data points uh, to your mesh. Uh, if that happens too much, say, uh, how would you go about um, throwing out sort of like the trash scans if you do something like that? So there, there are two sides, there are sort of two answers to this. In a way, the more it happens, the better. And the reason being that the more it happens, as long as it doesn't happen in exactly the same place, that will end up being filtered out by the system. So if you have lots of people walking, eventually you're going to be able to extract the, the underlying uh, system. Um, the second part of the answer is that we do have a system that establishes how good a scan is for positioning. And that, uh, we call it a scan quality classifier. And at this point, uh, that is looking for sort of more obvious things, not too bright, not too dark, uh, not too blurry, not in a private location, um, not inside a car. So there are, and, and a few other things. So we, we do have that filter, and we are working on, on better trajectory models. Um, but it, if people do walk a lot there, hopefully that actually will help. Thank you. Uh, Grima, this next question is for you. <laughs> you seem to have enabled a few thousand VPS locations. How do you plan to build a stitched full coverage map of the entire world from there? Um, so I think uh, the first part to it is actually scaling our infrastructure so that uh, we can build maps. So there are two parts to it. First is uh, actually having scans for all these locations around the world. And that's where our players and even US developers come in where you submit uh, scans where you want uh, us to build maps. And the second part is scaling our infrastructure to build more and more maps. And we are working on it. We have very aggressive goals for end of the year uh, and next year as well. Uh, to build on that just a little bit before we go to the next question, um, uh, I, when I talk about VPS, um, map building is inherently Sisyphean, meaning that like even if we had a perfect map of the world today for our launch, that would be great, but then it would be out of date in like a month. Um, so one of the big challenges we have uh, is not only how to build the maps once, but it, as you heard at the very beginning of the keynote, uh, that you have to build them again and again and again and find a way to keep these up to date, and there's a lot of trade-offs you have to consider in order to execute that. Um, and I think a helpful thing to compare mapping to is a lot of other types of infrastructure. 
whether you're talking about like the interstate system, but I often like to use like 4G coverage, where you see all those really obnoxious commercials where everyone's com like comparing their 4G coverage. One thing all those commercials have in common is it's actually less than half the United States has good 4G coverage, and it's not because it's an unsolvable problem, it's because if we had complete 4G coverage in Alaska, it wouldn't make a huge impact. So a lot of what we're focused on is pointing our resources and our development and all of our operations at where we can make the most impact the most quickly. Um, so that's gonna continue to be really important. And as I mentioned earlier, one of the most important pieces of input that we get from all of you is places that matter to you. Uh, that's a very high piece of signal for us in terms of where we decide to build these experiences because there is a lot of latent demand that can only be realized with the contributions from our developer community. So thanks. Uh, next question. I asked this in the previous panel, and, uh, but basically, uh, I have a game, Follow the White Rabbit, and let's just imagine we're following this rabbit through, say, San Francisco, since there are a lot of VPSs here. Um, I wanted it to, to behave, I wanted the mesh not just to understand like a point in space or on ground, and, uh, I, but I also want to know like if it's a fountain, for example, you know, here's where the water is, here, you know, because the rabbit would go swimming in the water. Um, it would do you know, some different things at the taco stand next to it or something. Uh, are, are we able to divide that, create a VPS where there's you know, multiple meshes that have different um, you know, uh, semantic classifications and then pull that back in as a developer? Uh, can we do that on the developer side? And then is it possible on the user's side to start assigning those classifications? Another one of my short answers, yes. Uh, <laughs> so we are already using the same sort of semantic models that you're, you're seeing in Lightship. We're using the same sort of models on the scans that we're getting from our, from our users, and we're building up the same sort of semantic meshes. So we already have the ability to say for a certain vertex, here is the primary class that is there. Ground, water, sky, not sky because those don't, doesn't mesh easily. Um, so we already have that. We're still iterating before it's ready for release. It's, it's, it's early days, but we, we very much plan and, and hope to release this. Could we and, add our own? Yeah, so I was gonna say, like, you could use semantic uh, information from the meshes that the user run already and basically get that data already. So if you, like most of our demo uh, that we show at the moment of that developer have shown are actually running uh, meshing at the same time. So you would get the symmetry channel and you could let your creature basically interact with the world and, and do that already today. Okay, great, thank you. So there's one fun question here that I'd like to take an opportunity to answer, which is how much will it cost to use Lightship EPS? Uh, so, I'll take that one. Uh, I'm very happy to announce uh, that during our public beta that starts now, uh, it will be completely free. Uh, and throughout public beta, we will continue to learn a lot about the system. Uh, today is probably gonna be one of those record setting days uh, for us. We've had a lot of traffic during the private beta, but we're learning a ton like as we speak about how the service scales, how much load we can handle, and how we can turn this into a sustainable uh, business long term in terms of supporting VPS. Uh, we're eventually going to move something called general availability, which where you'll see a bunch more features, uh, much more usage, we'll have much better informed models for how scaling works. And at that time, we plan to be billing based on MAUs. So uh, that is one really important business metric for us, as well as you and the applications that you build uh, in terms of how much usage you have of your app. We're gonna have to develop a better understanding of how our costs and our ability to provide a good service will scale with more usage. Uh, but even then, we still plan to have a very generous free tier that'll basically allow you to build to your heart's content and not have to worry about paying bills until you've found exactly what you want. Um, we'll probably have more details about exactly how that pricing is gonna work out, but certainly during the public beta phase, we don't want pricing to be a friction point for anybody here. Hey guys, uh, my question is like, how does uh, BPS interface with other or like the AR tracking, like image tracking or like the mesh system that you already provide? Uh, so there are two sides to, to the answer here as well. In terms of mapping, so the sequences that you would put into to build, uh, the scans that you put in to build maps, there the VPS at this point assumes there is a pose and assumes that there is a, a pose that has the correct scale. That is standard output for the likes of Air Kit, Air Core. If the scale is not correct, the system will probably not work very well. Or if this, the scale changes over time. It also doesn't like scale drift. On the other side is the localization. Uh, each localization attempt at this point is independent. So you do not need uh, a tracking system really in order to get a pose. You can ultimately send an image. There is an improved result by, by sending the up direction, um, but the, potentially that wouldn't necessarily be needed. 
Though I suspect the API at this point doesn't allow you to just send an image. So. Okay, but for example, with the image tracking, do, can it work like simultaneously? Let's say like this a scenario of like something like an event, you're using a, a public space that is supported in the BPS, and you want to enhance it with like, I don't know, like some banner for like more you, traditional you AR. You should be able to, to run both at the same time, uh, like if you, if you have the right libraries. Like the, the whole question is gonna be the local compute available if you want to run an AR, uh, like AR core, AR kit at the same time, like AR DK at the same time as that plus VPS. That might be, you might not want to be careful on how much, uh, how much system overload you're doing, especially if you add rendering to it. Thank so, thank you. Okay. Hi, Todd Little from Fair Worlds. Um, question about, so Google has their VPS system that they just announced. In terms of a roadmap, is there some thought about having both VPS systems being, you know, developers having access, you know, that they could have both VPS systems working together? I can try to take that one. So I, I'll, I'll say a couple of things. So though Google said that they have announced finally, they actually announced in 2018. So it's, it's not completely new. Uh, they, they have that uh, for, for quite a while. Uh, there is ways you could try to make them cohabit uh, together. Uh, there's possibilities, uh, and I think we haven't explored it too much yet, uh, but I'm sure some of you developers will, will dig into it and will find ways to, to make them interact. There is no reason why fundamentally they could not interact together. Okay. Um, Thanks so much. Cool, the next question we have is, how often, or how will the maps be updated? For example, what will the frequency of updates be to reflect new construction, roads, buildings, stuff like that? Uh, well, that's the beauty of having uh, user scans, right? Instead of having to drive your car again and, and, and get new data every six months or a year, we get data every day. So we can actually detect when changes happen and automatically basically update the map or, or decide to retire a node that we feel is not valid anymore and rebuild it. So that those are, like, you just need to have access to the data and the data is what we have. So that, that was actually my question. What I was really getting at is the non-wayfinding area because it's the gap in between that is more interesting in this context. You don't have the driver, the game, or the application to get that map of current updated uh, POI information. So the density of POIs doesn't guarantee you're gonna get overlap that covers it. That is correct. So currently we are focused on POI, but we are scaling those to do, to do more, and then there is ways for us to monitor actually the, to get data from people that are using the system also that help us detect basically any, any problems. But that's uh, future looking. To, uh, to build upon the sort of wireless coverage uh, analogy, I think a future might look kind of like there'll be certain areas where you have very fast internet coverage or very good map accuracy. And these are locations where you might have like a Wi-Fi hotspot. If you're sitting at home, you might have like a one gigabit connection with your ISP. And if you're out driving on the road, you don't have as much connection, but you have enough connection to still have the experiences that you need, whether it's just listening to music, whereas at home, maybe you're like streaming a 4K film. Um, I think there's actually a lot of parallels you can draw there in terms of the different types of map fidelity that are gonna be necessary to support the different experiences that you want to build. Um, and precision, like the precision of the experience and like how well everything has to fit together is probably gonna, you're probably gonna have the highest demand at that at like really crowded locations where there's lots of people having those experiences. Whereas if you're building something that needs to work like out in the field or out in the middle of a plaza with not a lot of features, there's actually a lot more tolerance for a little bit more error in that experience. So some of this sort of just works out fortuitously, um, but certainly the end game that we would all like to get to is having a map that is actually complete and fully stitched together as you were saying. Um, another, another, you know, one of the challenges of working with UGC, while it's a huge boon for us, is we don't have a lot of scans from UGC just out in random spots. They're very much focused in specific areas. Um, so it's, it's both, a, it's both a, uh, a blessing and a curse to be constrained to areas where we have the most data. But over time, obviously, we want to be able to incorporate more types of data to enrich uh, locations that are not super popular. And the same sort of thing points to the five meter halo that was described before. There is no five meter limitation in the VPS. It can work from far away. However, uh, it works better if you're close to where somebody scanned before. And people right now, our users, are, tend to be sort of encouraged to scan around certain locations. This is why we've introduced that sort of artificial limitation of, of five meters in order to ensure that those places actually work. But it, they will not in any way be limited to five meters. 
switch to finish the, the original SIGSD system was. So the original SIGSD system has uh, had a high, a strong algorithmic threshold to about two or three meters. It didn't really work beyond that. So actually in that vein, there's a really good question here. So how are multiple scans of the same BPS activated location handled? Are they mixed together? Will they return different IDs? Are frames from different end users added into the map? Right now, the, the various uh, scans uh, get connected into a graph. Um, we hope at some point to, to sort of merge the graph, fuse the graph, but right now, basically, they get connected into a graph, and when you localize, you can localize in any of the scans or any of the maps that are part of that graph and get a single global position relative to the entire graph. So, depend on which, uh, were you part of the closed beta or were you part of, yeah. yeah, so we'll take that offline because I think it's a special, but yes, in the past it was exactly, you would get an, a map ID back from one of the nodes that you were localizing, uh, and even though they were in the same space. Uh, so, we'll, uh, but talk to us afterwards, we'll explain how to, to move into the new system that's going to make your life a bit easier. The next question we have is, do you see a future where VPS can work in low light or at night? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I, to some extent, it depends on the ability of the camera to see. Uh, I would argue that with enough scans, the system will, will work in low light. But of course, you see less. The accuracy of the images, unless there's more noise, performance will go down. Um, but as cameras get better, yes, certainly. Uh, there's a really good question here that I can't answer, but I'm going to throw someone from 8th Wall under the bus, and that is, uh, when will 8th Wall have Niantic's price structure? Um, I invite everyone to come to the 8th Wall talk tomorrow and ask Tom that question. All right, cool. Mark is red. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, let's see. Um, can the developer build public maps? Are you supporting Scaniverse? and what happens to VPS code built in ARDK 1.3? Um, those are three disparate questions. I'll try to give some quick answers here. So in terms of can the developer build public maps, uh, one of the cool fun features that we've launched uh, as part of this is there's a workflow through which you can nominate new locations to be added as Niantic Wayspots. Once those are added Niantic Wayspots, anyone can use the Wayfarer app to submit scans of that location. Once we get to the data thro threshold necessary to activate that location on VPS, we can do so, and that will become part of the public map. So just to be clear, that is distinct from creating a private VPS location, which is a totally automated end-to-end -end process through which you can have a dedicated private-to-you development persistent AR space next to your workstation. Um, so that's what the Wayfair app is for, but there's a separate workflow to nominate new locations to add into that. Second part of the question is, are you supporting Scaniverse? Uh, so Scaniverse is a tool that's part of the Niantic family uh, that a lot of folks were using during the private beta to upload scans to us to activate and basically use as a stand-in while we built the Wayfair app. Um, we are planning on uh, retiring some of the functionality that was supported via the Scaniverse secret menu, uh, but not until we have fully, full parity of all of that functionality in the Wayfair beta app. And, and, and let me just yeah, with one thing. Keith is over there. Uh, he's the, the lead engineer for uh, for Scaniverse. And so, if you have any uh, specific <laughs> question for uh, uh, for Scaniverse, uh, either from product or engineering, uh, please go and talk to him too. Sorry, Keith. <laughs> and then uh, again, a very important question about what happens to VPS code built in ARDK 1.3. If you have been building as part of the private beta, I think. One thing I'd recommend is just get in touch with whoever you've been talking to on our DevRel team. Uh, we are currently working with a lot of different customers, developers that are finding ways to upgrade and make sure they can save as much of their work as possible from that process. Uh, we would love to follow up with you later on during this event or offline, uh, one way or the other, to make sure that you have the clearest path forward in terms of uh, upgrading from 1.3 to 2.0 and beyond. I think we've got time for one more question. Let's do... Yeah. Oh, go ahead. So in the meantime, before you have the whole world stitched together, how does it work when you are between different waypoints? Like, 
if you have experiences at different waypoints and maybe stuff in between, how does that work? Like, if I open up an experience at wait, one waypoint and I walk away and I'm now at a new one, can I still see the old one? Um, so if you, it kind of depends on how you build your experience. If you do build your experience such that um, you continue to track between them, for example, if you, le if you leave your, AR core, uh, your a ARDK uh, tracking running, then yes, you can basically have both at the same time and there will, there will be a way for you to continue to, to keep those on. And we are working towards letting you basically do, do localization on that, uh, but uh, only limiting the support. And then what happens if in between the two waypoints there's nothing really to track, right? There's no uh, recognizable object in, in between. What, what happens? Well, again, like if the platform supports it or if the support works, like uh, if, if on iOS or on Android uh, they can do, uh, they, they can track, then you'll be fine. Okay. Uh, and, and there is some example in some of the demos where actually you can see between uh, some way spot where you can actually see you swap the experience between the two, and so you, that gives you an idea of how it could work. Okay. And then I have one more question. Um, uh, so it, what... So I had a conversation with one of the developers earlier, and what I understood was that you could put anchors anywhere, yes. and then, so a waypoint and an anchor are not the same things. Is a waypoint kind of like a POI? So a, a, a waypoint is a Niantic uh, POI that is in, within our database, and your anchor is related to that waypoint, but it doesn't need to be on the waypoint, it needs to be around it. So once you have localized against a waypoint, then you can drop your anchor anywhere you want around it. Yeah, so effectively what happens when you go to a waste spot and you localize on Lightship VPS, you are now localized relative to that location. That sort of becomes your datum for any spatial information or any spatial thing that you place. So when we say waste spot anchor, that is an anchor relative to the waste spot at which you have localized. Um, and as, as Pierre was saying, as you walk farther and farther away, as your tracking degrades, you will naturally lose sort of track of where you are. But um, we can also, happy to discuss more, I think there's some stuff in the documentation about just basically best practices about where to anchor things to have the best possible experience. So the developer is saying you can put a uh, anchor anywhere. Yes. Like yeah. okay. Yes, that's right. Okay. Um, well, wonderful. We are at time. I just wanted to say uh, thank you again so much for being here, for asking all those excellent questions. Um, we have like an entire other page, uh, and we'd love to chat more the rest of today, tomorrow, uh, tonight. Um, and I want to thank, uh, again, so much to my colleagues, Garima, Pierre, Victor, for being here as well. Um, thank you all so much.